Amen. All right, tonight will be the first night of our Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to be beginning, as we mentioned in the, the bulletin, the announcements in Romans chapter number one. I want to give a quick explanation of the difference of the sermons on on the majority of time, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night. Sunday morning, Sunday evening, most of the time are going to be topical style sermons. But on Wednesday night, I believe, are very important time throughout the week services because it's it's not topical preaching. It's what's considered textual preaching. So it's going from, from verse to verse through a particular book of the Bible. <clears throat> the reason why that is important is to understand you know, uh, the context, understanding the purpose why books were written. Certain chapters in the Bible, when you read them and get to know them, you'll understand that they carry a certain theme. Not only do the chapters carry a specific theme, but whole books of the Bible will carry a specific theme. And it's good to know those books because then you can start later on comparing other things with that specific book. And you can get a deeper understanding of when that book was written and all different types of that, who wrote it. So that's one of the things. Tonight's sermon is going to be a little bit of a longer sermon. And I know everybody's thinking well, it's because of the latter portion of Romans 1. But that's not necessarily true. There's going to be, I'm going to have, a, I'm going to try to fit in the introduction to the book of Romans as well. Because it's also good to understand, like I'm saying, the importance of, of, of textual preaching and understanding books and chapters and things like that. <clears throat> it's good to have a history background. But let me tell you this. I'm not going to go to a historian or something like that. When we learn history, we learn the history from the Bible, too. We don't only get our doctrine from the Bible. You can compare things. You can see who wrote books, who delivered books, who all different types of things. And that's what we're going to get into right now. I also wanted to tell you my reasoning on, on preaching on, Rome, on the book of Romans. <clears throat> I had decided this probably maybe even like a year and a half ago, a year ago. I don't exactly. It was a long time ago when I decided I was going to be preaching on the book of Romans as on Wednesday nights. And the reason why is because the book of Romans contains every basic doctrine. Not only does it contain every basic doctrine, it also goes over and skims over like almost every single doctrine in the entire Bible. That's why when somebody gets saved, <clears throat> what do they give them? John and Romans, immediately. John is like, shures them up on the gospel and everything. And then the book of Romans is the very first book. That is when the, when the doctrine begins. Because you'll, you'll notice, you know, your books are categorized. You have the Gospels, the Book of Acts, and then you have all of the doctrinal books, which are uh, penned by Paul. I believe it's 13 books. It will begin with Romans and end in the Book of Hebrews. Now, I'm going to give you a quick breakdown of the Book of Romans. If you look at the Book of Romans, in chapter number 1, from verse 1 to verse number 7, you have basically Paul's greeting, where he greets them. Then in chapter number 1, verse number 8 to verse number 12, he gives more of like a commendation to the people, telling them of things that they're doing right, things that they're doing well. Then you really have the body, where he gets into like the meat of the letter, why he wrote them in the first place. <clears throat> that begins in chapter 1, verse 13, all the way to the end of practically... Uh, also, uh, chapter 15. When you get into chapter 15, he also starts talking about some personal stuff. And we'll get into that when we preach in chapter 15. Chapter 16, the entire chapter, it's the longest, uh, longest list of salutations in the entire Bible. It's basically just a list of just like greetings. Salutations is like a formal greeting. So that's the breakdown or the layout of the book of Romans. If you're going to look through the book of Romans. Now we're going to begin with, it, with the introduction here. Paul... It says in, in chapter number 1, verse number 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So right there in the very beginning, number 1, we can see who authored the letter is Paul. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, then he says, called to be a, an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now this, this letter is written to the, book, to the Romans, to the church at Rome. And... <clears throat> This is obviously true, this is correct, but everything, because when, when that says up there, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Romans, that is not scripture, right? So anything that anyone tells you, that's just the title by the translators. All the titles of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, those are all the titles that were given it specifically by the King James Bible translators. And those are Greek words, even the Hebrew books in the Old Testament, those are Greek words, Genesis, Exodus, now here, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Romans, it is correct, but you always need to search things out. You never need to never just take something for granted. You know, when somebody tells you, hey, that was written to the Romans, obviously you need to study to show yourself approved. 
You need to, like the Bible says, to prove all things. Look down at verse number 7. The Bible says, to all that be in Rome. So it's very obvious who this letter is written to. It's written by Paul, and it's written to the church at Rome. Now I want you to turn over to Romans chapter number 16, verse number 22. Romans chapter number 16, verse number 22. So... <laughs> a moment ago, you would have noticed that I said the letter was authored by Paul, right? It was authored by Paul, and Paul was the one addressing them. But that does not necessarily, and especially in this case, that does not necessarily mean that Paul was the one that physically wrote the words down. That Paul was the one that actually put the pen to the page, as it were. Look at Romans chapter number 16, verse number 22. The Bible says, I, Tertius who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. So Paul was the one that was speaking the words. We can see this in the Old Testament as well with Jeremiah and Barak. You can see Jeremiah speaking the words and he's writing the words down, right? So Paul, obviously, the, the scriptures are inspired by God. They're not Paul's words in the first place. He's the human instrument that God is using to speak the words. He's speaking the words and then you have Tertius who is the one that's actually sitting there, wherever they were in his office, at someone's house. You know, there's sometimes he would lodge in people's houses. He's sitting, he's sitting down, and he's writing the words at the mouth of Paul. Now, what that's called, the, the actual technical term for that is the, the amanuensis, or an amanuensis. That's what Tertius would be, config, would be considered. That's the man or the person that's actually pinning the words down. At the mouth of someone else. It's like a certain, the word means like man obviously comes from a human being writing like a manuscript. And then incense is referring to like someone doing like, like secretary type duties, like a servant is what that word comes from. But it's the actual person, the manuensis is the person that wrote the words down. That means that they're not the ones, they're not the source of the words. Also, you can consider someone that copies a copy of something as an amanuensis because they didn't write the original copy either. So that would be like a scribe or an amanuensis. In this case, <clears throat> we see that Tertius is the one that wrote the words, not Paul. You do have cases where Paul actually pins the letters, and he tells you that. If you look while we're here in Romans chapter 16, look at verse number 1. <coughs> it says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. That's, in, that's actually located in Corinth. Centria, if you look that up. So he says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a succor, that's like a helper of many, and of myself also. So Phoebe is the one that's actually bringing the letter. He's saying when he writes the letter, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister. So when they, re when they receive this letter, Phoebe is obviously coming with the letter. If there's another person, Paul chose to at least mention Phoebe and not mention that other person. But Phoebe is the one that's actually carrying the letter. I commend unto you saying, like, you can trust me. I I'm actually approving of this person is what that means. I commend unto you, and it says that you receive her in the Lord in whatsoever business she had. And, you know, <clears throat> you say, what can you learn from these types of things? Well, number one is this. I know of churches that will have, you know, uh, you know, women in their church that will serve in certain areas. And obviously we know that the Bible teaches that there are certain offices that a woman cannot hold. But one of the things that women can do is be a soul winner. And I know of a lot of churches, not just some churches, that will try to prohibit or prevent women from being soul winners, which is 100% not biblical, right. not even a tiny bit. You can see multiple examples when you look you know, all throughout the Bible. And specifically, there's an example in Philippians chapter number 4, verse number 3, where Paul says, Help those women which labored with me in the gospel. Philippians chapter number 4, verse number 3. So these women are laboring with Paul in the gospel. So they're going out and they're preaching the gospel. So this teaching that like women can't do anything besides bear children and that's it. They can't earn any rewards is false. Right. Women can be great soul winners. Women can be better soul winners than men. Right. They can be able to, you know, I know all kinds of women that are great soul winners. I've met all kinds of women that were great soul winners, and every time they went out, they were in a they were in a good area, they were getting people saved constantly. They just gave the gospel well, they were personable, they were, you know, they understood the gospel very well, and they were able, and that's you know, that's that is a good sign that someone is a good soul winner, is is not only when you go to like an area that is very productive. 
that's a very receptive area, but someone that can basically get someone saved in almost any neighborhood. And what that tells me is this. It's different for a person to give the gospel to, you know, what, what, what I would consider an easy case. And that's someone that's more like you or that you click with, right? You know, I, I noticed that when I started giving the gospel in the very beginning, <clears throat> that it's very difficult to give the gospel to children in the beginning. And the reason why is because you have to break every little thing down. You have to explain every little basic detail. And the better you get at giving the gospel in general, the better you'll notice that you'll get at giving the gospel to children. But you know what? There's also another category where just some people are different. And you just have to get used to giving the gospel. Obviously, the gospel is the same. But you have to get – when you go soul winning a lot, you'll notice that people are different. And there's different types of personalities. And the better you are giving the gospel, you're able to explain things in different angles where one person wouldn't get it. You have a different example. And then all of a sudden they're like, you know what? That makes sense to me now. And that's where you can see a good soul winner. And I've seen many men, many women, both, that are great soul winners. Women aren't limited to where they just can't earn these rewards. Women can have just as many rewards in heaven. They can be just as good of a soul winner as men. So this is not a church where we're going to discourage people from going soul winning. We are going to encourage women to go soul winning as often as they possibly can. Amen. Obviously, their primary duty is for their husband and for their children, but we want the women to go soul winning and to be great soul winners as well, not just the men. Also, our children. We want to train our children to be good soul winners right. as well. Go back to Romans chapter number 1. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 1. We're going to look at verse number 2. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 2. <clears throat> the Bible says... Which he had promised a for. That's like an older version or older word for the word before. Which he had promised a for by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now the word which there is an antecedent. That is an antecedent that is referring back to the gospel of God. <clears throat> now you know what that, that tells me and what you can learn from just verse 1 and verse 2? Is that dispensationalism is false. Already by the point we got into Romans chapter number 1. Notice what he's saying here. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. The is the definite article. If I said the Jessica, can I be talking about, let's say if I said the Jessica, how many Jessicas am I talking about? One, right? You're talking about, well, that's what a definite article is. One Jessica, right? Okay, when I say the gospel of God, how many gospels are we talking about? One, okay. <clears throat> Which had promised the four by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It just makes a general statement because, guess what? All the prophets in, in all of the Old Testament preached the same gospel. Not only did they preach the same gospel, all of them, but the same gospel that he's talking about right now. That Jesus Christ came, which we're going to get into here in the next couple verses, is the same gospel that all the, all the prophets of all the Holy Scriptures testify to in all of the Old Testament. The gospel of God. Amen. The gospel of God, as it says in Romans chapter number 1. <clears throat> Verse number 3, the Bible says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So concerning his son, referring back to the gospel again. again. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Now, a lot of people here in verse number one, verse number four, I want to point out something to you that it says declared. Declared. There's a lot of different groups out there that have a lot of different opinions about what it means to be the Son of God. Jesus being the Son of God. And I'm not going to go into this in detail right now because I'm going to preach a sermon in the series on Sunday nights about defining the sonship of Christ and what it actually means. But a couple of the opinions that I am going to touch on right now is, number one, some people believe that, that, that Jesus Christ became the Son of God in his baptism. It's false. It's 100% not true. Number two, some people believe that Jesus Christ became the Son of God when he was resurrected. And this is the verse that people will point you to. I want you to pay, pay attention to the second word in verse number four. Look what it says. And declared to be the Son of God with power. Does that say he was or became the Son of God at that time? No, it says he declared. He's declaring this to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. Watch what it says. By the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ preached that he was the Son of God prior to the resurrection. So if he said he was the Son of God prior to that, he's a liar, number one. But he's not, obviously. <laughs> The Bible teaches that he declared to be the Son of God with power. What does that mean? That, that, what that's saying is that he proved 
that he was the Son of God. He declared himself as the Son of God when he rose again from the dead. He was preaching he was the Son of God, but he declared it, he proved it at the moment when he rose again from the dead. He went around preaching and they saw miracles, they saw words that he said, but can any man ever raise himself from the dead? No. Jesus Christ was fully God and was fully man. He was the Son of God living upon this earth. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says, By whom, that's obviously referring back to Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. <clears throat> now, just a grammatical, um, uh, just grammatical advice or grammatical lesson to, to give you a help, help you understand, because a lot of Paul's letters do this. And what we would do here oftentimes, not necessarily in this case, but he'll do this with com with, when the King James Bible translators will use commas. He uses a lot of parenthetic statements when he's talking. Romans 5 is a big example of that where there's just like what we would say today is like tons of run-on sentences. It's obviously grammatically correct. English changes over time. But there's a lot of parenthetical statements. And right here when you're reading when it says, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, and then it says, for obedience to the faith among all nations. Notice that it says there at the end, for his name. Now this here would be considered somewhat of a parenthetical statement, and it makes much a lot of sense if you've ever been taught this in school when there's a parenthesis. That's what I'm referring to, a parenthetical statement, kind of a pause or something that sits by itself. When there's a parenthesis, the, one of the ways to read that is to, you read it both ways. You read it including the parentheses, but then you also read it and you skip the parentheses the next time. If you have trouble when you're reading something and you see the commas, skip the commas sometimes, especially in Paul's writings, and then go back and read it with the commas. And maybe you'll understand the sentence, sentence a little bit better of what he's trying to say. The overall sentence, you'll know what he's referring to within the commas when you read the full sentence and then without the, the, the parentheses there. So notice right here he says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship. And he says, For his name there. And, and for obedience to the faith among all nations. And the, the faith here is for his name. Look down there at verse number 6. He says, <clears throat> Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. Now I want to deal with something in verses 5 and 6 uh, as well. A lot of people have weird ideas about who the apostles are and how many apostles there were. A lot of people, and I would say the majority of Baptists believe that there are only you know, 12 apostles. That's what the majority of Baptists believe. That's what the majority of any Christian believes, period. That is not correct. The Bible is real clear that when Jesus ordained or appointed the apostles or the, the 12 disciples in the beginning... It says in Luke chapter 10, verse number 1, for example, it says that he also ordained or appointed, I think it uses that word, appointed 70 others also. There's not only, and I'm going to prove that to you right now is why I brought that up, that this passage actually disproves that, that there is more than one apostle. Notice what he says in verse number <clears throat> verse number 5 again. By whom we have, we have received grace and apostleship. Is we singular or plural? It'd be plural. So how many people are apostles that are talked about right here? More than one, at least, right? right? Exactly. Now, it's not who he's writing to. I can prove that to you as well. Look at. Look, we'll read verse number five and verse number six together. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for, the, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, the church at Rome, number one, is not going and preaching to all nations. We know that just by the letter. We can read that, that they're stationary. But keep reading what he says in verse number six. Among whom, talking about Jesus, are ye also the call of Jesus Christ? So they're the call, but are they the apostles? He specifically says that they were they were called unto apostleship. And then the next verse he says, Among whom are ye, all, are ye also the call of Jesus Christ? Look at verse 7. To all that be, or be, be in Rome, beloved of God. Watch what he says they're called to be. Called to be saints. The we there is referring, I believe, to the other person that's writing the letter. Who was there when he was, when he was writing the letter now? Him and Tertius. Who's traveling and preaching to all the world, to all nations? Obedience to all the nations. Obviously, Tertius is with Paul. So it would make perfect sense that Tertius, he could have been one of the 70 that were ordained before Paul. We have no idea. The we there is obviously plural. But if you read the whole context, he says in verse number 5, By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the, to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom are ye also. They're, so they're also called, but watch. The call of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. 
I believe that the apostleship is referring to Tertius and Paul. And then he goes in here <clears throat> speaking about those also that are saints. When you read here in, in verse 7, to all of you in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing that you can prove from verse number 7, and this is going to pick up here in a minute, but, but, but there's so much in like these first seven or eight verses that so many people are false, that, that they're just wrong about. They don't understand who an apostle is and who are not apostles. Everyone's not an apostle either, because we can see some people here are saints and some people are apostles, number one. Number two, people are wrong about who saints are. And it's funny that we're reading the church, of, the, the, the epistle written to the church at Rome, and it's the Roman Catholic Church that are ones that are wrong about who a saint is. Right. Right. Now, right here, he says, to all that be at Rome, not some, to all that be at Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, the beloved of God, called to be saints, these are all different like adjective phrases that all apply to all that be at Rome. And then he says, beloved of God, called to be saints. Everyone at Rome was a saint. Every single person at Rome that was saved was a saint. Go over, flip in your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. I forgot to include this, but I believe I know where it's at. I believe it's 1 Corinthians. It might be 2 Corinthians, chapter number 1. Yeah, look at verse number 2. 1 Corinthians, chapter number 1, verse number 2. The Bible says, Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you know who saints are? They're those that have been sanctified. Do you know who have been sanctified? Everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord. Every person that is called upon the name of the Lord is a saint. As opposed to the false teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that says that there's only select people or special people like St. Paul or St. John or St. Michael. That's not what the Bible teaches. And if the so-called church of uh, the Roman Catholic Church were to just go back and read the letter to what they think was their original church, which I don't believe that for a second, they think that they sprang from this church. Why don't you just read the first letter that was written to your church if you think that, that that's the church you came from? And then you would get straightened out on some of the false doctrine you believe. Right. Not only on this subject, but many other subjects. So the Bible teaches very clearly that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord is a saint. Look at verse number 8. <clears throat> the Bible says, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request that by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come on you. Sometimes we can read over some of these statements and not really understand like the impact of what he's saying. Verse number 8, he said, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. And then he says <coughs> that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. That's pretty powerful. Right. The, the faith that, the, that the, 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 the people that attended the church in Rome, it was literally, they had such strong faith that all the churches talked about like, man... I wish I had faith like the people that went to, you know, go to the church in Rome. That's something we should strive for. And like I said, when we read over this, this is real. This is the, the Bible. I believe this is true. I believe that all the churches spoke about the church of Rome and the great faith that they had. Another thing we read over there, you noticed, is that uh, Paul says at the end of verse number 9, he says that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Think about that, what Paul did. <clears throat> He said, without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. You know, what it does is it kind of makes you do a little bit of intro introspect on how much you pray. When you read all of Paul's letters, he's constantly mentioning that I'm praying for you always. I'm always praying for you. I, and, and these are all different types of groups of people. It's interesting, too, that he uses that phrase that he says, without ceasing. He uses this also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. At the very end of that chapter... In 1 Thessalonians 5 is where you find, like, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, and then it says, pray without ceasing. So Paul's not a hypocrite. He's telling other people, pray without ceasing. But then you look here in Romans chapter 1, and he says, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. So he's making mention of them in his prayers always. He's not ceasing to pray. 
Verse number 9, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests that by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. <clears throat> Verse number 11, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end he may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and and me. So we see the importance of fellowship right there. Verse number 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, <coughs> excuse me, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Now, that phrase right there, but was let hitherto, that word let is used very different sometimes <coughs> in the King James Bible. And the word let in the King James Bible means to hinder or to stop. And people say, well, oh, you know, why don't you just change it if just nobody uses it like that at all? It's not true that people don't use it like that at all, ever. And I guarantee I can give everyone an example here where they're like, oh, you're right. When someone's playing tennis and they hit the ball and it hits the net, what do they say? Let. Let. And why? Because the, 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 the uh, whatever it's called. The net. the net. I said net two seconds ago, too. The net. What did, what did the net do to the ball? It prevented the ball from going to the other side. It hindered or stopped the ball from going to the other side. The, every word in the King James Bible you can find in use today. Sometimes you may just not notice it, but you can find every... That's just an excuse because people don't like the King James Bible. That's always an excuse because they just want to get rid of the King James Bible. And then when they change it, guess what? They don't only change the word let or the these and the thou. They make all kinds of other changes, too. Just further proving that's not their agenda in the first place. <clears throat> so he says in verse number 13, there at the end, that I might have some fruit among you also. <clears throat> and then he says, even as among other Gentiles. So what is he referring to here when he says that I might have some fruit among you? What well, he tells them, he says, even as among other Gentiles. He's talking about getting people saved. He's talking about your Gentiles. And I've went to other cities where other Gentiles lived. And I've gotten some fruit among them. I've gotten people saved there. And he says, and that's a good testimony. He says, I desire to come to Rome, not so that I can see the pretty sights, not so that I can go and, you know, and, and meet the emperor. I desire to come to Rome that I might have some fruit among you also. That I might be able to go to Rome and I might be able to get a bunch of Gentiles saved. That I might be able to get a bunch of people saved. <clears throat> Look at uh, verse number 14 now. He says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Now, I want to, uh, <coughs> I want to, uh, real quick, I want to give you a definition of a word that there's, there's a lot of confusion about this specific word right here, and that's the word Gentiles. Now, some people will say, you know, that the word Gentiles is, it, it means that it's, it's of a certain line or lineage that people came from, that a group of people came from. It's only a specific lineage. Of Noah's line. I can't remember exactly what who it is, but it's only one specific line. The modern, or the, uh, the the most commonly held view is that Gentiles are all those that are not of the of Israel. That's the basic definition. That if you were to ask any Baptist, he would say you have the Gentiles and you have Israel. Now I'm going to give you a definition of what this word is. Go to. We're going to go to two places. Keep something here in, in Romans chapter 1. Go to Luke chapter 12, verse 30, and go to Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 32. So go to Luke chapter 12, verse 30. Luke chapter number 12, verse number 30. And then go to Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 32. There are different ways that you can get the definition of words. A lot of times, you know, um, let's say that the Old Testament. Uh, that the, there's an Old Testament quote in the New Testament. There's an example, you know, in the book of Isaiah, it, you know, it, it, it's actually quoted, I believe, in Luke chapter number four, I believe it is. But there's a chapter in Isaiah, you know, where Isaiah says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach. He says, uh, good tidings unto the meek. And then you look in the New Testament and it says gospel. So you know what the word good tidings means? It means gospel. So you get the definition by comparing these two words. I believe the Bible is perfect, so when it uses two words, it's not a mistake. It's because it's the same word. They're synonymous. You can flip, you can you know, interchange each of those words. 
We can do the same thing in the New Testament if we look at the Gospels. In the Gospels, if you compare quotes, Matthew to Mark, Luke to John, there might be slight differences. It's not an error. It's because it's the same word. It's synonymous. You could say either one. Look here in Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 32. It says, For after all these things do the, what? Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. So notice he says here, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. That's the word that we want to get the definition of. Look over at Luke chapter number 12, <clears throat> verse number 32. Or, I'm sorry, verse number 31. But rather, seek ye know. Is that correct? No, 30. I'm sorry. Verse number 30. For all these things do the, what? Nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. You know what Gentiles are? It's not a specific line of a lineage. You know what? In this case, all the Baptists happen to be right. It's anyone who is not of the nation of Israel. It's all the nations of the world. It's the Bible's clear definition, my friend. I can further prove that by Romans chapter number 1. Go back to Romans chapter number 1. And look what it says in the end of verse number 13 again. He says that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Now watch what he says. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and and to the unwise. Who are the Greeks? The, the, right now, the Roman Empire was ruling. It used to be Greece. That's who was ruling. The Roman Empire took it over, but everybody was still considered Greeks because they kept the Greek culture. Greek is everyone that's living in, in the civilized world of, of, of Rome at that time. Do you know who people that were not living in the civilized world were? Barbarians. Those are uncivilized people. So anyone that's not among the nation of Israel would either fall into one of two categories. They would either be civilized or uncivilized, wise or unwise, or they would be a Greek or a barbarian. You know what the word Gentile means? Anyone that's not among the nation of Israel. Clear definition. It's the nations of the world. Because he's speaking to Israel when he said that in Matthew chapter number 632 and also Luke where we looked at. He says, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after. Like, why are you seeking after these things? The nations of the world is obviously not who he's speaking to. It's super clear when you look at it. You can, there's other examples. I can't remember the other one. In like Malachi, you can compare another passage that's quoted with the New Testament. Gentiles are the nations of the world. It's super clear. <clears throat> Keep reading there. He says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Already by Romans chapter 1, verse number 16, we have Paul preaching. If the Roman Catholic Church were to just look at this letter, it would just disprove their doctrine all the way already by verse number 16. He clearly says right here that the gospel is the power of God. And how is it the power of God? To everyone that believes. That's the one requirement. Over and over and over again, the Bible is super clear about that. There's only one requirement. It's believing and we're saved through the gospel. The gospel is the good tidings, the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Look there in verse number 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. What that means when it says from faith to faith, it's saying to the Jew and also to the Gentile. Read verse 16 and 17 the way that it's worded. Unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Saying it's the same way for the Jew and it's the same way for the Greek. From faith to faith. And that's why he says, right after this, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's actually a quote. I think I had it written down. It's, it's from Habakkuk chapter number 2. It's verse number 4. That's quoted from the Old Testament. It's quoted a few times. I believe Paul also quotes that in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter number 3, I believe it is. But that's quoted from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 4. Now look at verse number 18. This is where it starts to change gears. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness... <clears throat> and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So these people have the truth. He said they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse number 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Talking about the fact that they are the creation. And he gets into that right here. 
For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. When I go out soul winning and I knock on the door of like a hardcore atheist, I don't have like really any – I'll tell you one little small trick that if I think the person's not like super hardened because both atheists have been like that and that, that way for a while. And the majority of the time it's not you know some type of knowledge that they're missing. They've rejected God because they don't like God. That's, that's pretty much what it almost always is. But if I can – I talk to somebody and I sense that maybe this person has a little bit – you know, of, of, you know, some sort of interest or anything like that. I'll tell you what I do in just a moment, but I, I want to say this first. I do not debate with atheists about creation at all, period, and I never will. It's a total waste of time. What I do is I quote this verse to them in Romans chapter number one, verse number 20, and I explain to them that whether there's a creator or not is not the debate. Because that's super obvious. The Bible says, for the invisible things of them from the creation of the world are clearly seen. It's not like, I, I know, it, it's, it's just kind of vague or it's hard to see. It says that these things are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, it says, even his eternal power in Godhead. So it's obvious. You really only have two options, folks. You have the option that there's a creator, whoever you believe that that is. There's a creator that created everything. And then you have option number two. If there's not a creator, then nothing created everything. That's all. That, there are no other. There aren't any other categories or any other options. That's breaking it down to its like most simple form. Someone created everything or nothing created everything. And when you say that to atheists, they're like, well, that's not exactly what I believe. But you don't have any other choices. That's it. It's either there's a God or there's not. There's a God who created everything. And to look at this world and say, I don't believe that there's a creator, you are willingly ignorant is what you are. The Bible says in the Old Testament, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I show this verse to an atheist, and, or I quote this verse to an atheist, and if they're not interested, I don't spend any time. If the person seems like I might be able to get somewhere with them, this is one, one technique that I'll use occasionally <clears throat> as a tip. I'll, I'll talk to them. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll talk to them about, you know, I would say, are you 100% sure if you die today, you go to heaven? They always say the same thing. Raise your hand if you've heard an atheist say this. Are you 100% sure if you die today, you go to heaven? And, and either right there, if they say, I'm an atheist or whatever, and then you say, I, they either say this right there or they say it right here. Okay, well, do you know for sure what you have to do? Or do you know what you have to do to get to heaven? Or, or what do you believe a person has to do to get to heaven? If you just ask those questions, they all say, I've read the Bible. How many times you had oh, an atheist say, I've read the Bible multiple times? Yeah. Like every time I talk to an atheist, that's what they say, every single time. <clears throat> and I always ask them this, because they love the debate so much. I always ask them this. Okay, so if you've read the Bible, I understand you don't believe it. What do you believe that the Bible teaches that you have to do to get to heaven? I've never gotten the right answer from an atheist one time, ever. So I'll tell them when they say that, you know, well, you got to be a good push person. you got to, you know, keep the gold rule. Whatever they say, you got to be baptized. Keep the commandments. I always say to them, that's not what the Bible teaches. And the Bible is real clear about what you must do to go to heaven or what you must do to be saved. And right now, what you think the Bible says is wrong. So you're rejecting something you've obviously never even heard before. Do you mind if I show you real quick? I've had like maybe four or five atheists like let me at least partially get through you know, the gospel. I've never got one saved, but it does work occasionally that they'll at least listen to you. And a lot of them still just want to debate and stuff, but they'll at least let you listen to, they'll at least listen to you for a few minutes there. But right there, it's, what, what it's teaching is that it's obvious that there's a creator. That it's obvious that there's a God. Verse number 21 says this, because that when they knew God, so these people knew that there was a God, they knew God, they knew who he was, obviously, this specific person, they knew God, they glorified him not as God. So they not only know God, they know who that God is, obviously, because it says they glorified him not as God. Neither were, were, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And we're going to come back to these words in just a moment, but it says, and their foolish heart was darkened. Look at the next verse there. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. 
Sounds a lot like an atheist right there. Verse number 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Every atheist that I've ever known is like some environmentalist weirdo. You think that's a coincidence? They're like some tree.